Wonderful. Nice to uh, be with you all, if not um, yeah, in person, at least uh, online. Unfortunately, this is what we seem to be doing a lot these days. But nevertheless, I sometimes wondered what it would have been like in the time of the Buddha, if the Buddha had live streamed many of his talks to the world, and we still would have had um, people in many, many different parts of the world uh, who could have accessed the Buddha's teachings that could have been recorded and it could have been there forever. So even though we cannot travel overseas, uh, even, actually I did say that to many people, uh, I told them that when I was uh, booked my air ticket to go to Melbourne, I said, I'm going overseas from Perth to teach. And many people said, you can't go overseas, Ajahn Brahm, because you can't leave Australia, not very easily. And then I told them that to get from Perth to Melbourne, you have to go over the Australian Bight. That's the flight path. So Perth to Melbourne is usually overseas. <laughs> but I uh, couldn't go in the end, had to cancel the ticket. But nevertheless, it's now the time to give to stump to Waysack time. And Waysack is very meaningful for me. And there was that first opportunity which I had, and I, and I was still a student when I was only 19 or 19, going to one of my first Waysack ceremonies and being so inspired by the teachings of the Buddha. And so inspired that I decided that, well, if the Buddha can become enlightened, why can't I? I got energy, I got faith, I got a good brain, surely I should be able to get enlightened. And that was the first time I realized not how to get enlightened, but how not to get enlightened. <laughs> because what I did, I heard that the Buddha made this resolution before he sat under the Bodhi tree. And the resolution was that I will not move from my seat of meditation until either I'm fully enlightened or the blood in my veins and arteries dries up and my bones turn to dust. I will not move until one of those two things happens. And being an arrogant young man, arrogant young English student, when I got back to my room after the face act ceremonies, I just sat down on my meditation uh, cushion, not a zafu, man. And I sat on my meditation cushion. And there I made the resolution. I am, like, I've got lots of things to do in my life. I'm a very busy young man. So I want to get enlightenment out of the way as quick as I possibly can to do all those other things which are important for me. <laughs> and so I sat down on my seat and said, I am not going to move until I'm either in light or I'm basically dead. Now in those days, my meditation, my personal best, my PB was about 25 minutes sitting still. <laughs> we all got to start somewhere. And that was about the most I could actually sit still for 20, 20 minutes. But nevertheless, I made the same resolution. I'm not going to move until I get 40 in my turn. And I, I bang up all my energy, all my will, all my determination to do this. And I lasted, I, I, did, I did complete a PB, a personal best, for about 35 minutes, by which time it was torture. My whole body was aching and burning and hurting. I wasn't used to sitting still so long. And even though it was, was really being hurting up in my eyes. And I did actually find that my blood had not dried up and my bones hadn't turned to dust at all. Even worse, <laughs> I was not nowhere near it. <laughs> but it taught me something. It's one of those first things that this enlightenment is not something you get through willpower. It's not what you get through wanting. It's far more subtle than that. And of course, it took many, many, many years and especially you know, learning how to meditate properly, learning how to arise, uh, have uh, insights arise to the absence of five hindrances and really understanding what this path really is and how enlightenment happens, how meditation happens. 
And basically, just in brief, it is these five hindrances which we have. The, the wanting, that's the first hindrance. Karma Chanda. Well, basically, it's one, wanting in the realm. <laughs> wanting in the realm of the five senses, the five sense world. That type of wanting. And uh, the ill will, which is not wanting something. And the sloth and torpor, restlessness and remorse. The last of those hindrances is doubt. And to be able to abandon those five hindrances is not easy. They need to be suppressed, they need to be lessened. And when those five hindrances, what in part is the pancha niwarana, once those five hindrances are um, lessened, they are eased, they're weakened, then you can actually see, hear, smell, taste, feel with your body and know with far greater clarity. It's a fantastic thing to be able to experience when those five hindrances are very, very, very weak. The mind is empowered and the mindfulness is clarified. And this is just how the Buddha taught. It's in the Nalakapana Sutta, the Majjhima if anyone wants to look that up. But these are where the mindfulness is empowered and if you're going to get deep insight and understanding, you do need such strong degrees of mindfulness. And that strong degrees of mindfulness is not just sustaining your mindfulness for long periods. The whole mindfulness is very, 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 very powerful. A good simile for that, you know, when I used to go traveling before COVID, sometimes the people were so kind that they would put me up in nice hotels. No, because there was no temple close by, or the temple was full, or it was, they had other uh, things to do. So sometimes you stay in lovely hotels. And you know, being a monk, you had to present yourself properly, and so had to shave in the morning. And this was one of the first times I saw these you know, top class mirrors and bathrooms. And, and it was really difficult, because usually in where I live, this is my hut, just the door around behind me there is my toilet door. Just in there, there's just a very simple basin and a very ordinary light. And so in the morning when I shave my, my, my chin, it's very easy because I can't see very much. <laughs> but in these, in these hotels, the light is so clear. The reflection on the mirror is just so accurate that when I shave, I can still see stubble. I have to shave again and shave again. And oh, it goes on and on and on, trying to be presentable. When I was just an ordinary monk, a young monk, a working monk, you didn't need to worry so much. But now people take photographs of you, you're on the video, you're live streamed, you're on the internet. I'm just going, I have to look presentable. So what happens is it takes much more uh, time because it's like you, your mindfulness of your stubble on your face is much greater. You can see more. And when it comes to taking out the stubble of your defilements, and the not wanting, the ill will and all of that, that is very difficult to take that out without a very strong awareness. But one of the wonderful things about the strong awareness and you know, on this talk on how to become uh, enlightened, I want to become enlightened, one of the wonderful things about that strong awareness, and I focus on this a lot in my talks, is that powerful awareness is always with a company with a lot of joy. It's uh, one of the attributes of strong awareness. That you're happy, you're joyful, you have what we call piti sukha. It's as if the, the mind is, you know, has a certain amount of energy, but we waste so much energy, mostly on thinking, planning, uh, dwelling in the past, which you cannot change at all. And for people who say, but oh, Ajahn Brah, we have to learn from the past. You, many of you have heard me say so many times, you don't learn from the past, nowhere near as much as you learn from the present, from this moment now. So if your mindfulness is just locked in the past of something which has happened to you, you're not gonna get very far in their path of enlightenment. And a good example of that, it's an old little anecdote, 
that sometimes that on teaching meditation retreats, somebody complains that there's one person in their cottage next door to them is always banging the door when they're trying to meditate or banging the door when they're half asleep and just going, you know, uh, in the sleep time. Imagine, Baba, can't you tell them to please don't bang the door so loud or don't bang the door at all? Or can we have a list of all the series of people banging the door to meditation retreats and put them in one noisy cottage so they can keep themselves awake and there's the quiet cottage for all those people who could behave? And of course, I say no, because you're not understanding the disturbance from noise. And the disturbance from noise is just mostly living in the past. Somebody bangs the door. And then you start thinking, who was that? Why did they do that? We shouldn't allow people to have doors being banged like this. We should ban them. We should blacklist them. We should actually put some money into doors which actually don't bang. We should somehow just get some high-tech doors so that they close by themselves nice and softly. We should actually just do And the door finished banging about five minutes ago. And the person is still thinking about it. And that door is banging inside their mind. And sometimes it keeps banging inside their mind for days. Every time they think about it, it's banging again. That is how to stop the banging. The first bang is very quick. It's over in you know, half a second. But the way it echoes in a person's mind goes on and on and on and on. And that is very simple to let go of very easy to stop when we can let go of that past and then we can be in our moment we don't waste so much mental energy the people are you know they don't have huge amounts of energy and imagine all that energy being free to be in this present moment imagine all that energy taken away from worrying about the future you can't predict the future I thought that this time, this is the second attempt to get to Melbourne. I did have a ticket to Melbourne just uh, in the new year. Another sort of um, uh, lockdown in Melbourne. And now I thought, well, it's been many days, no sort of COVID in Melbourne, should be okay. Had the ticket, it was supposed to fly on Friday afternoon, Thursday morning, had to cancel it. So anyway, I'm still gonna try again. Try a third time, lucky, <laughs> who knows? But anyway, but that, I don't know when, maybe we'll see what happens. But the reason I don't know when is because you don't really worry about the future so much. You don't plan it so much. Which means you have far more energy being in this present moment, learning how just to be here. And when you have more energy in this present moment, you do actually find that the mindfulness gets very, very, very strong. And that's where we have these beautiful experiences. They were like getting up in the morning and you can see like the full moon out on wayside morning. And it's just gorgeous. And sometimes I wonder, do other people see the moon in the same way I see it? And actually the answer is no. Because you have to have a very clear mind. You come out of meditation had a really nice deep meditation and the hindrances are hardly there at all. And then you look at that moon and it's fantastic. It's more clear than an ordinary person sees that moon. The vision there, the object is the same, but your mind is clear. Just like when I shave my chin under a very good um, light and a nice mirror in these you know, five star hotels. So little by little, you can understand just you need to clarify that mind and get the mindfulness to be empowered. And you can notice, notice the sign of those empowered mindfulness states. And I always try to find out when was the first time this happened to me, having a very strong mindfulness. And I think the first time was just uh, my first meditation retreat. And that first meditation retreat, I was at Cambridge. I was still a student. And I had a girlfriend at the time. And uh, obviously, you know, she couldn't come on the retreat with me. And, but I had a nice meditation there. Got some very deep states of meditation. I don't know why. 
obviously had some inclination in that area. Every morning, we were allowed to go for a walk for one hour, a bit of exercise before breakfast. Otherwise, we're just sitting and walking and meditation walking all day or listening to talks. So that exercise was obligatory. And because you know, this was the university where I was studying, I knew the place, I knew the area, and not far away from the uh, retreat place, which was just a, three boarding houses for students, not far away was the botanical gardens. And it was only maybe three or four minutes, walked the gardens, and I just went in the back door of the garden knew them well, never expected. And please excuse me if you've heard this story before. I tell lots of people, whatever stories you've heard before, I've heard them many more times than you have. <laughs> but I get so much joy out of these. They're true stories, they're meaningful, and they bring back wonderful memories of what happens when you, you get good meditation. Because in the entrance way to the botanical gardens, the back entrance, sorry, there was this amazing clump of bamboo, one of the most beautiful clumps of bamboo I've ever seen in my life. And it just grabbed my attention straight away. And I do, rec I remember these moments because when you have strong mindfulness, they leave a very strong, indelible impression on your mind. You now we have this word trauma for when people have indelible bad impressions from like car accidents or abuse. Or this is the opposite, the same strength. You can't forget these things. You, you don't want to forget them. They're beautiful. But anyway, just I was standing there watching this cup of bamboo in the morning wind. And I was just transfixed. It was wonderful. And I had enough presence of mind to realize that if someone had seen me, a student, I had very long hair there and a big bushy beard, <laughs> I shaved a bit since then. You know, just uh, my mother, just you know, she died about nine years ago, but uh, my mother always would tell me, my lay name was Peter. She said, Peter, you should get your hair cut. When I finally did get my hair cut, when I became up, she said, that's not what I meant. <laughs> you, you've gone too far. <laughs> oh, just my dear old mum. But anyway. So I had long hair, and I thought if someone see me, they'd probably thought I was taking drugs or something. So I decided just to sit down. That was acceptable. Staring, standing for you know, many, many minutes was just a little bit weird. So I sat down on a bench close by and just stared at my most beautiful clump of bamboo. When it came time for the breakfast, I had to pull myself away. I went back there the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. Eight of the nine days, I spent the morning just sitting down, watching, staring at this beautiful club of bamboo in the world. And I never finished with it. I never got bored. I never sort of stopped being able to see new things in that club of bamboo. Just the whole experience was wonderful. And anyway, after the retreat had finished, when I went back to studies, had a free afternoon. And so I thought, I'm going to spend the afternoon just going to check out my most beautiful clump of bamboo in the Cambridge Botanical Garden. Got on my bicycle, cycled through the busy traffic into the back of the Botanical Gardens. And there I saw the, the clump of bamboo. So dry, desiccated. It was just not beautiful at all. And then bamboo does not grow well in the cold climates of UK. It doesn't belong there. But that really shook me. Where had my most beautiful clump of bamboo gone? And now why is it just so ordinary? And not ordinary, worse than ordinary. And that, those experiences of what happens after meditation to your um, hindrances, you do actually find that after good meditation, your mind is really clear. Whatever you see, whatever you smell, whatever you hear, whatever you even touch, when you touch things, as texture. You can feel so much more. You just watch, you know, your, your fingers are just 
it's touching. It's like full of life. It's not dull at all. Of course, the opposite to what I'm saying is what's known these days is depression. Depression is very, very low energy. So low that whatever you touch, there's no, hardly any feeling there at all. Whatever you smell, no smell, taste, it's all bland. But everything is all gray. This is its opposite. And it's a really powerful opposite, the peaks of, of mindfulness and awareness. And what you see is gorgeous. As a monk, you can get so much happiness, so much joy, seeing so much more deeply into things after deep meditation. Oh, this is a wonderful life. But this is like mental imagery. It's like how the mind is empowering what you see and what you hear and what you taste. And it empowers that, it empowers your mindfulness, and that gives you the opportunity to actually get deeper into the nature of things, which is important, which is how um, these enlightenment experiences happen. And that's one of the reasons why, that as a teacher of meditation now, you look at you know, the people who are meditating, you make sure that it's not they're just not just sitting for hours on end. You're also making sure that they're smiling and happy. They've got joy on their face. And that tells me much more about their meditation than whatever they tell me about how deep they think they've got. It's the smile, the joy, the happiness. That is a much better indicator. And I say this because it's one of the famous suttas which the Buddha taught, which is a Dhammachadya Sutta, I think. And that was where King Kennedy, one of the Buddha's supporters, he was a king, a monk. So it's wonderful having a king as your supporter. And you know, this he lived in um, uh, Sawati, and just very, very close by, within walking distance, was the Jeta Grove Monastery, Jetawana. And the Buddha would, uh, so the King Prasenadi would every now and again just go and visit the Buddha. And this one time when he went to visit the Buddha, and the Buddha was talking to him, he was asking the king, why do you like coming to this monastery so much? And the king said, there's a wonderful saying. He said, because all the people in this monastery, they always look smiling and happy. And it's a wonderful little snapshot of when there were photographs. It was an audio photograph, the king saying, and what it was like visiting the Jetawana monastery outside of Sawati, where the Buddha was staying. And then the Buddha said, yes, that's what you can expect when the people staying in the monastery are meditating and getting deep meditations and also getting deep insights into the Dhamma. You can tell that by the happiness and the joy. So when people want to become enlightened, there's a good reason behind that. But just wanting to get enlightened just turns a lot of people just so frustrated. What is enlightenment? How do you get enlightened? And first of all, what is enlightenment is a very uh, difficult question to answer for many people. <laughs> Because <laughs> a lot of them make it up what they think enlightenment is. And of course, my little anecdote about that, uh, it, even when I was a student at school, now even though I came from a poor family, there's scholarships all the way, all the way up to Cambridge, for goodness sake. But I never, my, actually, my father died when I was 16, so he couldn't pay anything. My mother was really poor. So it was all scholarships. But I remember just going to the chaplain of this secondary school where I spent my, my those years in London, in Hammersmith. And I went to the chaplain, made an appointment with him. And I said, oh, look, you know, I'm interested in spirituality and religion, but I just can't get my head around you know, what God is. Now, what is God that you're supposed to worship and believe in? You know, what is it? You now you're the chaplain here. I'm just a, a student studying mathematics. So tell me. And I still remember the chaplain telling me, oh, yes, God, it's, 
is ineffable, it's beyond words, it's the beginning and end of all things, the Alpha and Omega, the ground of all being, the, the, the unfathomable. I said, yeah, but what is it? Oh, it's, it's unconditioned, it's un, unknowable, it's beyond words, blah, blah, blah. And I said, you're not telling me anything. And I went away from there thinking that that chaplain didn't know what he was talking about. If you know what you're talking about, you have to explain it in words which other people can understand. So years later, <laughs> I asked the Buddhist monk the same question. Now what's enlightenment? What's Nibbana? And then I remember that monk telling me, oh, Nibbana, it's beyond words, it's unfathomable, beyond beyond sort of knowing the, the beginning and end of all things. It's the unconditioned, it's the ground of all being. It's just, I know ground, I know being, the ground of all being. Can you explain that with words which ordinary people can understand? I had a good brain, I can understand words in quantum physics, but I couldn't understand that. And so I came away from that Buddhist monk thinking he doesn't know what he's talking about as well. It's only later on when you, you go to, to monks who really know what they're talking about. And monks like an Ajahn Chah and ask him. And then you get some wonderful answers, beautiful answers. So you want to be enlightened. Now what is enlightenment anyway? Enlightenment is the end of all wanting, end of craving. When this word dunha, craving, finishes, ceases, it's gone. Okay. Hello. Come back again. Okay. Hopefully I'm still on. Very good. They're trying to get me. Yeah, I'm back again. You see, that's an example of ceasing. <laughs> when things finish and stop. <laughs> and the more you want them back, the more crazy life becomes. So anyway, the end of wanting. It's a beautiful little um, way of understanding Nibbana. And because it's a wanting causes a suffering. For those of you who've been on those meditation retreats, which I hold every now and again in, in my retreat center in Perth, and I'm just going to put a plug in for your retreat center, which I'm 100, can I say 120% behind? You know, I just really love retreat. It's a beautiful way of making Buddhism grow in Victoria because that meditation empowers. Uh, all the people there to get closer and closer to understand what enlightenment is and what the Eightfold Path is and why we keep and how easy it is to meditate if you know how to do it properly. And so that's why I, I give as much as I can of my time, my effort, my whatever, to um, help that retreat center come to fruition. But anyway, the retreat center where I sort of teach, there is a lot, I teach in many centers as well. And that one that we used to have a lovely cartoon on our board. And the cartoon was, I want happiness. And this gentleman who's suffering a lot came into the room to meet this monk with his sign, I want happiness, holding it up. And the monk so took that sign and said, there's two mistakes there. First mistake, I. So the monk crossed the eye out. And on the board, that piece of paper, it read, want happiness, just two words. The monk said, second mistake, want. So the monk crossed that word out, too. And then he held the sign up with just one remaining word, happiness. <laughs> End of problem. I want to be enlightened. Two big problems there. I want. If you can scrub those out, what's left? Enlightened. Okay, that's a simple way of explaining these things, but it's more profound than most people understand and accept. And it's from the sense of I, we get wanting. Where there's wanting, there's an I. 
You can't have one without the other. This is what the eye does, what the sense of self does. It wants to protect, control, own. It wants to do stuff. And so to be able to let that sense of eye vanish, first of all, don't philosophize it about it too much, because it's basically people don't know what they're thinking about. Thinking too much, knowing too little. So little by little, we lightened. So we started the Eightfold Path. And as we practice that Eightfold Path, it's usually through wanting. That starts to, to disappear. And with it, your sense of I, your sense of self also starts to vanish. Because the two of them go together. Where there's wanting, there'll be a sense of self. And when the wanting disappears, the sense of I vanishes, and you feel so free, nothing to worry about anymore, nothing to want. I, and many of you may have heard me, I do these meditations on the Buddha. I did this only a few days ago for a um, Bhikkhuni Monastery over in the UK for their WASAC. And I, I did it over here in Perth for our WASAC ceremony uh, a few days ago. And that's where I ask people to be sitting down and just imagine, imagine you're the fully enlightened Buddha, just freshly enlightened, sitting under the Bodhi tree in Bodh Gaya. And I ask people to use their imaginations if they know about enlightenment. Peaceful, calm, free, you're enlightened, you've got nothing more to do in the whole universe, nothing to lose, nothing to gain, nothing to be afraid of. And you try to create this feeling, this emotion, what it must be like to be enlightened, what it must be like to realize that you really have done all the work you ever need to do. There's nothing more to be done. You've done all to be done. You're totally free at ease forever. Real retirement. I know many people are happy when lockdown finishes or they're happy when they go on holidays, when they're free, they don't have to go to work, when the illness is overcome, when the problem is solved. Imagine multiplied by a billion. Totally free, nothing more to be done ever. Totally at ease. Nothing to worry about, ever. Still, all those defilements which people are trying to overcome, they've been overcome, what would it feel like? When you can actually experience some of that, we call that a taste of enlightenment. Get its flavor, what it must be like. And one of the things you notice will be that all the wanting, all the struggle, all the wanting to attain things, get things, change things, alter things, all that wanting has stopped and you're free. Just imagine some of that. And then people actually get really meditations after that, simply because maybe for the first time they're going in the correct direction. Instead of trying to wanting to be able to watch their breath or wanting to sort of uh, let go of their body or wanting to get rid of the aches and pains or wanting to get insights and they don't know what that insight is anyway they want. It's crazy sometimes that so even a young monk, I thought of the simile, sometimes this Buddhism and I was a monk and I was really committed. It's like getting on a bus, not knowing where it's going to. I thought, my goodness, you know, just... When I get to Nibbana, I'll be happy. I've got a bus. Is that where I want, really want to get to? And it's only by seeing great monks like Ajahn Charles and seeing how he behaved. Well, not reading these things in the suttas, but actually seeing it firsthand. And other great monks who were from a really long way away on the path. So a long way on the path of not fully enlightened. And seeing how they behaved and how happy and, and peaceful they were. That gave me the confidence I got on the right, the right bus on the right journey. So anyway, 
it gives you the, the confidence this is going in the right way. And so you realize that this Eightfold Path, what the Buddha kept on saying was a way to enlightenment. It's got nothing to do with willpower, nothing to do with wanting, everything to do with stillness, allowing things to disappear. Words like renunciation, letting go of things. Words like you no know, stillness. What does it take for your mind to stop moving? I often describe that mind, of course, use similes. It makes it very easy for people to understand. And it's an old Buddhist simile. Mind is like a lake, a body of water. And imagine that lake up in the mountains. And you, you've hiked in the evening on a wayside night. And on that wayside night, uh, you find that, that the lake has got waves on the surface. So you look on the surface and you can't see the reflection of the moon. It's distorted. And that's a beautiful simile for what happens when you know, you're thinking. You're doing something. Your mind is moving. Okay. It distorts the truth. You cannot see the clear, beautiful reflection of the full moon in the night sky. <coughs> Sorry. But if you manage to get up that mountain, <coughs> a beautiful, clear night, and that lake, that pond, whatever body of water it is, is perfectly still. And it's like a, a sheet of glass, like a mirror. And to see the full moon reflected in such a still body of water it was often said, I think in Japanese and Korean culture, it's the most beautiful way to see the full moon. And this is when your mind is so still, there's no thoughts in it. It doesn't move. Full awareness. Mindfulness incredibly strong. Then what it sees, it sees fully, clearly, without any uh, deforming of what you see. And that is powerful states. But in order to be able to do that, now how do we get the water to be perfectly still? And this is one of my old similes, and I usually teach this every year I go to Melbourne, so I'm going to do it online. See, this is my, actually, it's not water, it's tea, excuse me. So I'm looking at my tea, I'm just describing it, I'm going to hold it perfectly still. I'll have to hold it up here. I'm holding my tea perfectly still. It's moving. And I've tried this many times. I mean, sincerely trying with all my effort, focus, concentration, awareness, trying as best I can to hold this cup of tea so it's perfectly still. I haven't achieved this once, not even once in my whole life, to hold something perfectly still. Until you see someone like an Ajahn Chah, and he tells you, if you want this water to be still, it's very easy to do. Put it down. Let it go. Actually, you can just move the screen so you can see the, the cup. There it is. It's perfectly still. So it just shows you just how stillness is caused, where it comes from. And, a, and a, many of you have heard me many times before. When we're talking about this path, this eightfold path, and the eighth factor is samadhi. And please do not translate, render that term samadhi as concentration. That one word has caused so much mischief in people's path towards enlightenment. It doesn't mean concentration. Concentration is what you do through force, through effort, through trying. Stillness is what you do through wisdom, through kindness, through letting go, renouncing, putting things down, learning 
what peace is and how peace happens. You put it down, you let it go, and the cup is peaceful. Now just to give it a little bit more authority, that is pretty much my simile. But my teacher Ajahn Chah, instead he would actually put up his hand and he'd wave it up and down. And he said this represents a leaf on a tree. And it always moves because the wind is blowing. If the wind stopped blowing, the leaf would move less and less and less. <coughs> until the leaf would become perfectly still. And he said that leaf represents your mind. Your mind moves because there's a wind blowing it. And that wind is the other winds of wanting. That also includes not wanting. Wind of wanting makes your mind move. So the next time you try meditating, you sit down, don't want anything. Even that Jan would also tell us that. He said, we meditate not to gain things, not to attain things. You try to attain enlightenment, you want enlightenment, you don't get anywhere. Actually, you will get somewhere, you just get frustrated and think you can't do it. But you sit down there and let go. Don't want anything. Just observe the mind. Be kind to it, be peaceful to it. And feel just how it can become really still and peaceful and powerful. Some people do complain. They said, oh, when I meditate like this, just the mind becomes um, dull and sleepy. But you don't meditate long enough. That sleep is just the brain just taking a little bit of uh, sleep deficit time. But you carry on and after a while, you don't feel tired. You're peaceful. And the longer you are meditating, the more still you are, the more you... You see the deeper it is. And if you do any breath meditation, for example, the breath is so easy to watch. It's gorgeous to watch. You see so much of it. No effort. It's just there. You get so still and peaceful. It becomes full of joy, and then the joy turns into these beautiful lights in the mind. It's just a mental object. A physical object has vanished. Now you're in the, the mind sense. Just getting that much power in your, your meditation, that really just, whoa, that gives you extra powerful mindfulness. And little by little, you see things you've never seen before. One of the things which happens on this path to enlightenment is that you get scared. So many people come up and say, oh, I was afraid of meditation. I just couldn't go any further. There's too much was happening. It's just too powerful for me. And it's quite synesthetic, so the Buddha says this is what happens. Because what is occurring is you're getting very deep. You're, trying to, you're actually starting to see, you know, this, this fallacy of who you think you are. I am the doer, I am the knower. I always say those two things are the last two citadels of the illusion of oh, self and me. And to actually to penetrate those takes courage to see something you've never seen before. To see something which does challenge you. To see something which makes you look at life in a totally different way. That happens. So when a fear comes up, great. <laughs> You're getting somewhere in your meditation. I always see that fear is fear. Losing something which you think you own. Imagine you don't own anything. Nothing. You don't own property. You don't own reputation. You don't own health. You don't own the skin of your body, the flesh, anything of the body. You don't own your memory. You don't own your will. You don't own your knowing. What on earth do you think you own? As the Buddha kept on saying, not me, not mine, not a self. And that's for everything. 
physical and emotional, including every type of consciousness, anywhere, everywhere. All of that, there's no consciousness, any type of consciousness, which is me, which is mine, which is the self. You can let the whole lot go, because none of it belongs to you. You don't let it go, it just goes. There's no one there to do the letting go. That goes to little by little things vanish and disappear. And that's scary. It's like you're going to places you haven't been before. Oh, who touched for me? A lot of people say they want to be enlightened. <laughs> and they get close. Oh, no, no, it's too much. You have to let go 100% of everything. And that's tough for many people. It's worth it. It's beautiful, it's joyful. Even when people start getting into deep meditations, they get start to get deepened. Sometimes they get this fear comes up and they deliberately stop themselves progressing. So many of you have got some really nice meditations, but can't go further. What are you holding on to? What are you afraid of letting go of? You can see that. Let it go. Wow. Just going to the next stage is just so much more beautiful. For me, it's just truly things was powerful enough. The insights you get afterwards was fantastic. And you always went to back to the suitors and checked it out in the Pali. Because sometimes the English translations, I already mentioned one of those English translations, you know, things like... Uh, Concentration for stillness, that's a crazy translation. Stillness, things stopping, peaceful. That's much better. There's also some many other weird translations. We use the weirdest translations which fit their delusions, basically. And so you have to be careful there. Check and sit deep, Pali verses. And there you can actually feel and find out what these words really mean. So you can check me not going off, of course. But anyway, little by little, your hindrances get weakened. You get more powerful. And you can sit for longer. Easy. It's not a willpower anymore. You go deeper in your meditation and then after a while, you break through some of these hindrances. You break through some of these attachments and defilements. Things start to vanish and disappear. Again, that vanishing and disappearing, that's one of those other words which I just uh, try and make much more uh, meaning to. They have things like viraga. Some of them call it dispassion. It sort of can mean that, but that doesn't really give power to that word. When you call it fading away, Nibbana, cessation, disappearance, gone. Those are much more powerful words. But anyway, little by little, as we meditate more and more and deeper and deeper, the things do disappear. It's great when they do. Uh, one of the similes which I invented to make it more clear what happens on the path of enlightenment and why these things vanishing are so important. And don't be afraid when they vanish. They'll come back again, unfortunately, but until they vanish once and for all. But anyway, so it's only a temporary vanishing, first of all. But when they vanish for many minutes, maybe hours, it's a fantastic experience, full of deep insight. And the simile which I often give is a simile of the tadpole and the frog. Tadpole, growing up in the water, lived all its life in the water. Even if it went to school in the water, went to university in the water, did Abhidhamma courses in the water, and knew everything, became an expert on water. How can a tadpole know the reality of water? No more than a fish can know the nature of water. You were born in it and lived all your life in it, knowing nothing else except water. In fact, you don't notice water at all. It's always there. 
But then the difference between the tadpole and the frog is one day, little frog, she grows legs and arms. A little frog growing legs and arms. Now she jumps out of the water. The first time, you don't think she knows what on earth she's doing. She jumps out and then she's in a world where she'd never been before. She's crouching on dry land. The thing which is gone, water, it's not there anymore. First time that's ever happened. If you can sort of imagine what that must be like. As something which was always there all your life and now it's gone, it's vanished. That would be scary, but also really interesting and peaceful and wonderful and joyful. So anyway, <coughs> Once the frog has left water for a little while, it has the opportunity to get the insight in what water really is, what its nature is. And then, when I understand these things by the absence. And this is actually what happens even when you practice this path, meditation happens. Your body vanishes and disappears. You can't feel your legs, your hands. It's just not there anymore. You smell, taste, sight, you've got your eyes closed. Even you can't hear things. Your five senses, which make up your body, have stopped. Really stopped. If somebody shouted at you, you wouldn't hear them. If the bell rang, I can't, can't hear it. Someone, so a good example of that is this, this um, student of mine, he passed away many years ago now, but he was, he was in the British Army and he's older than I am, but he was, on, he was a staff sergeant or something. But anyway, they used to go on exercises in, I think, West Germany and West Germany in those days. And he told me he suffered from migraines very, very bad migraines. And so when they had a rest for a cup of tea, British Army, that's what they did, lots of rest for cups of tea, he would try and find a dark place like an old barn in the, in the farmyards or something and sit in it. And when it was really dark, he'd, all he'd say, he never learned meditation. He just said he went deep inside to where he couldn't feel the pain and just sat there. And that was what he was saying to me. But I questioned him afterwards, after he told me that on one occasion, you know, he had a very bad migraine, he went into the barn, sat down there, and went deep inside, he couldn't feel the migraine, but he also he couldn't feel when the soldiers, it was time for them to leave, and he hadn't come out, so they went in there, picked him up, and put him in the back of the truck. And you all know that soldiers are not the most um, delicately um, handed people, he didn't feel a thing. He was, he was perfectly aware, but inside, he couldn't feel his body. Couldn't feel them picking him up, putting him in the truck. Couldn't hear the truck sort of starting and going down the country roads of Germany, you know, maybe off 50 years ago. And afterwards I questioned him and he, he did get into these deep meditations at the time. He said later on in his life, the migraine was healed and didn't come up anymore. He was very glad the migraine had disappeared. So he wasn't that happy that he couldn't get into those deep states of peace anymore. <laughs> but this actually was showing you what happens. Your body and the five senses vanish. And you're still perfectly aware and very peaceful, very happy. And it shows you that you are not these five senses, you are not this body in any which way. Not as a theory, not as some belief you get from the suttas, reading what the Buddha said. It's not from something you worked out by yourself. It's not what you've heard by experts. It's your own personal experience, direct, challenging. There you are, no body. One of the results of this, I was telling this to other monks in Bodhinyana Monastery recently, is you understand what death is. 
no, uh, not going to be afraid of death anymore. Just the five senses going, disappearing, stopping. You've experienced that before. And it's wonderful, free, it's so much of a burden. Because that's only one thing disappearing. And then, of course, the little tadpole jumps out again, so it becomes a frog and jumps out many times. It sometimes goes further away from the lake. And this is one I always love saying this because very few other monks talk about this, is that sometimes you jump out of the lake and what's missing now is not, not your body anymore. That's already gone a long time ago. But your parts of your mind, first thing which disappears is your will, your choice, your volition, it's totally gone. And that's usually second jhana and above. And that's powerful. You're sitting there, you can't do anything. Just no button to press to come out. No sort of uh, lever to do. No little mouse you can press to get any activity. Really at peace. And that peace, that stillness, samadhi, that's why the Buddha mentioned the bliss, the ecstasy of that second jhana is the bliss of renunciation. So it's the bliss of stillness, samadhi jha, the bliss born of stillness. To understand how can stillness be so ecstatic when nothing moves, frozen like ice, like a diamond, nothing moving. Now, once you get those sorts of experiences, as I mentioned, you don't need to, you actually can't think at the time. When you come out from those meditations, you can't forget them. Those strong memory happen because the mindfulness is enormously powerful. And these are real things. And they actually show you what the will is. Every now and again, you have all these discussions, the nature of free will, uh, uh, free, free won't, as Professor Libet used to talk about, free won't. But then, when you are free of will, there's no will left there for a while. And still, that thing which you'd lived in, like the frog, had lived in water for such a long time and I jumped out of it. You've jumped out of these parts of your mind which you didn't even notice. You thought you knew them. What you understood as will was just something else. Real will and all the things which are derived from will stops in that second jhana. You're free of it. Really getting close to what enlightenment is. Will is gone. It comes back again afterwards. At least you can understand what it truly is. Just like once the frog goes back into the water, it understands just what the nature of water is because it knows what it's like when water finishes, when it ends, when it ceases. And then you go even deeper. <laughs> when you're knowing your consciousness starts to vanish. That's the last little place we hide out, we think we really exist. I am the one who knows. I am the, the deathless consciousness. I am the mind beyond the mind, but I know what rubbish all that is. And I say that with respect, because after a while you see that even the, the knowing, the mind in all its different ways, all types of knowing, all types of consciousness, the whole lot, not me, not mine, not a self, subject to dissolution, subject to fading away, subject to ending, it's the ending of things. Now I say all these things, many people argue with me. I don't care. Because you know you're saying these things and you're putting these seeds in people's minds. 
even though many people think, oh, they don't understand Ajahn Brahm is just teaching too deeply, or he's just getting a bit old now and should retire or whatever, I'm not sure. Actually, I, for those who haven't heard it, quite often I told my monks, I've been training for years, I said, I'm getting old. And the other monks are very kind. All those monks who I've trained for years and years and years, they're so got so much loving kindness towards me and gratitude. And they, they came up to me and said, Ajahn Brahm, you're not getting old. And I thought, oh, isn't that nice? They care about me. They say I'm not getting old. They say, no, no, you're not getting old, Ajahn Brahm. You're already old. <laughs> it's true. I'm not getting old. I'm already old. <laughs> Am I? My body's old. My mind? Is it old? Is it young? It's terminal. Insight gives you terminal sickness. Not in the ordinary way. I mean, things are liable to end. You, your whole five candles, everything. Going, going. Oh. So you put seeds in people's minds. That's what Ajahn Chah used to do to me. Put these wonderful seeds in the mind so you can really understand in the future and what Dhamma is. When I was with him, I understood a lot, but not that much. Little by little, you put these other seeds in the mind. Little things like, you know, how to become enlightened. When I was a young monk, first year, I think, I remember just these were talks which were translated. He actually did the same talk again and again and again and again and again. And, again. and then after about a month or two months, then he changed the topic, you know, it would alter. But he kept repeating the talk so many times. And I, I thank him for that because that really drilled it into my mind. Even though I did not understand it, I knew it was important. And that was the, the simile of the mango orchard. He said his monastery was a mango orchard with all the trees planted by the Buddha. I thought, hey, I know everybody wants to think the Buddha visited their country. But the thing that Wat Pa Pong in Northeast Thailand was visited by the Buddha, that was stretching the truth a bit too much. And I realized this wasn't truth, this was a simile, which expounded truth much more deeply. And he said, all the trees were planted by the Buddha, and now 2,500 years and more later on, those trees are still standing there, they're mature, and there's so many delicious mangoes on those trees, all ripe, and incredibly beautiful and tasty. And he said, but the problem is, you can't reach those mangoes by getting on a ladder. You can't throw stuff up there to get them to fall. You can't shake the tree to get them to fall. These days you say you can't get a cherry picker to reach them. You can't get a helicopter to get those mangoes. To... He said, there's only one way to get those mangoes on the trees planted by the Buddha. And this is such a beautiful simile. I just, it gives me goosebumps that I heard this from a great teacher like in Ajahn Chah. He said, the only way to get those mangoes from the trees planted by the Buddha is to sit perfectly still underneath the tree. Be still, 100%. And hold out a hand, and a mango will fall right into it. <laughs> Crazy teaching. How on earth can that happen? Everything I'd ever got in life which was worthwhile, I strived for. I worked hard for. I you know, lost sleep over just staying up late and studying and doing this and doing that. And this was something completely different get the most wonderful things in the world. Insights, enlightenment, bliss, powerful states of mind by being perfectly still. And holding out the hand, he never explained what it meant to me, but I always interpret it as being opening up your compassion, your kindness. 
to allow from stillness and kindness. I mean, really big stuff, big kindness, big stillness. And then things fall right into it. Beautiful insights, beautiful Dhamma, all stages of enlightenment and stuff. And that's actually how it works. So little by little, that stillness, that power, that's how these things happen. So little by little, we want to become enlightened, we want to understand the process and what happens in the very end. And all the obstacles which you get on the way, the fears, the, ooh, what more do I have to give up? You give up everything, give up the owner as well. Just like those <coughs> shop sales in Melbourne. We're, we're shutting down, everything must go. <laughs> That's what you think of putting up on your monastery. Shutting down, you're shutting down, everything must go. Every attachment, everything you own, every owner, every client, every sort of service provider, whatever, everything goes. Why do people get afraid of that? There are many people left who are still deluded and carry on the world for you. But as for you, it's time to go. Time to finish. It was one of the reasons why we had a little discussion in Bodhinyana Monastery with the monks the other day. What is your most favorite place which we celebrate on Waisak? You know, we have the three places. You know, we have Lumbini where the Buddha was born. We have Bodh Gaya where the Buddha was enlightened. Or Kusinara where the Buddha entered Parinibbana. And I always put my hand up and say, Kusinara, where the Buddha did the full Nibbana. Maha Parinibbana. Stopped completely. Ended. Fulfilled the promise. But of course, you know, between the Buddha's Nibbana, enlightenment and full enlightenment, he made a resolution. And I mentioned this just to come back to one of those things which I'm using my last years of my life for, is actually to build the the retreat center at NBM. That's a dual Sangha there. And that's incredibly rare. It seems to be working. Bhikkhus and bhikkhunis in the same huge monastery. And the Buddha said that he wouldn't enter Parinibbana until he'd established a fourfold assembly flourishing community of bhikkhus. We have that. Flourishing community of bhikkhunis. Fully ordained nuns as the Buddha intended. We're starting that in Australia. We're on the way, we haven't finished that yet. And then thriving communities of good practicing lay men and lay women. Ones on the path to enlightenment, or even enlightened. When those four are established, then the Buddha will pass away. And that was almost like this triumph of winning the, winning the cup, just getting there, establishing this. And I always remember that I'm a, a, an English monk. How on earth did that happen? And I'm a teacher, quite well known. What on earth's going on? What's going on is teachings of Buddhism, the Dhamma. They are for everybody. They're still incredibly strong around our world. And growing at the same time. They're powerful, meaningful. They have so many other small benefits like hitting cancers and other stuff. Understanding the nature of the mind is huge amounts of wisdom coming from the Dhamma. The main thing, that place in India, North India, Kusinara, where Buddha lay down between two trees and peacefully entered the deep stillness of the jhanas. And then the immaterial the mind is disappearing and then eventually disappearing once and for all in Paranibbana. 
That is full. Word is like awesome, incredible, powerful. You get the more you understand what the Buddha was up to there, what he was doing, and all the many men and women from so many lands and nations, and countries, old and young, people physically deformed, people who are serial killers, people who are mad, finding through the stomach some, some solace, some peace, some insight some stillness and going all the way to what the Buddha experienced, Parinibbana, complete Nibbana, cessation. So there we go. That's that right that time? Yeah, yeah, exactly the right time. Yay. So now that's the talk finished. So now we have some what we call interrogation. It's really Q and A, but questions. It's Q and A time, Bante. Ajahn. Yes, interrogation. <laughs> yes, I think we hit a record today. That was um, over five hundred and fifty people that were tuned into the into the Dhamma talk. Excellent, so that's an absolute record for the BSV. Ah, oh, you deserve it. So thank you, um, thank you, Ajahn, for your uh, Dhamma talk. Just, um, I know there's a few people that have already raised their hands, but uh, can I just run through this with for everyone? Um, we 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 encourage everyone to um, to ask questions directly to Ajahn instead of typing them in, which is our normal format uh, on Sunday. So please take the opportunity to do this. Uh, you can do that by clicking the raise hand button on the Zoom pa panel. Don't physically raise your hand. There's over 150 people and we can't see who's raising their hands, okay? So, and then wait until you're invited to unmute your microphone. And then uh, you'd also, we request that you also start your video so that Ajay can see you. It's much more personal that way. And then keep your questions short and succinct, okay? And thank you. Okay, so I'm just gonna stop that screen share. And I see the first person is uh, Lena. So if you can um, unmute yourself. Yes. Hello. Hi. I hope. Hi, my name is Lena. Hi, Lena. And hi. Uh, hi, Ajahn. Thank you very much for the Dhamma Desana just now. It was very helpful and it really uh, helps me to learn more things about Buddhism. I have one question though. Let's say if uh, someone reach Nibbana, right? Uh, that that's, that means that this person doesn't want more anything to do. Doesn't this mean that this person will become unmotivated to do anything? Like, you know, this person will not want to eat <laughs> anything, will not want to do anything. They will just sit still and then, you know, <laughs> do nothing. It's just like, you know, it's just a bit uh, weird for me. A lot of this sounds weird, but the closer you get to this, the more sense it makes. But what happened once the Buddha had become enlightened? He sat yes. under the tree for seven days. He just did some walking meditation for seven days. And he did very little until one of his old friends from a previous life under Kashyapa, the Buddha, a fellow called Sahampati. And there, he was a monk with the Buddha in a previous life. And Sahampati became a, a non-returner, was reborn in the, the pure abodes of Sudawasa. And when he knew that his old friend, Siddhartha Gautama, had become the Buddha, he came down to congratulate him. He said, the day Buddha Samyutta. And there, uh, congratulated the Buddha and then asked there are many beings in this world with little dust in their eyes please go out and teach the Dhamma for their benefit and happiness many will understand and that was a very significant event if no one had asked the Buddha would have just kept set, sitting there and become what we call the Pacheka Buddha the Sarum Buddhas to be able to ask, that was the motivation which needed, which was kept the Buddha going for 45 years. It didn't come from within him, it came from without. 
or the wanting inside of him had gone. Okay. Thank you, Wajan. Uh, and the next person is Ning. Ning, could you unmute your mic, please? Oh, yeah. Uh, hello, Ajahn. So I'm Ning. I want to ask if the awareness of non-self and emptiness is only achievable as a monk or nun. And when lay people do get aware of this at some point, uh, how are they supposed to reconcile this insight with their daily lives? So sometimes at work, we need to have certain uh, specific stances it's quite necessary to survive, be it at work or at home. So we make it very conflicting to stay neutral or have goals in life when we have such insights to renunciate all things. So how should a person with such insight balance their life with it if, let's say, we haven't, they haven't choose the monastic route? I'm still quite confused with this part. Thank you. Uh, just after a while, if you get those really powerful, deep insights, you know, it's, you've got no choice in the matter. You become a monk, you become a nun. Monastic life chooses you. It's not an alternative anymore. It's just where you belong. But of course, it takes a long time of practice before you get those deep insights. What you get in the first part, you get the lessening of your identification with your body or with your education, with your mind. You can tell how a person understands how much they identify with themselves. You know, you're, you're a young woman, and probably very concerned of how you look and how you present yourself. But you know, you know that's going to disappear. Just have a look at your grandma, and that's what you look like in a few years' time. <laughs> it's not a big deal. But then about your knowledge. You now, I used to know a huge amount about theoretical physics, but you know, the field has changed so much. I've let that all go. And are you okay when you're wrong? Many people, they're wrong and they don't admit it. That's a sign of a strong sense of self. You know, I'll let you into a secret. It's okay to be wrong, to make mistakes. Mistakes is where we learn. A little bit of you lessen your sense of self. You know, you try and be sort of presentable. You don't really worry too much, you know, being a beautiful girl or not so beautiful. Being kind is more important than that. And little by little, just your knowledge. You, know, you ask other people for help. Nothing wrong with that. You no, know, because you don't know everything. No one can, and you forget a lot of things later on. So little by little, as you lessen your sense of self and what you think you own, you find it's much easier in life. And you know your sort of your loved ones, you know, especially your parents and brothers and boyfriends or husbands. I don't know what your status is. But little by little, you let them go. They're not going to be there forever. So when they die, you don't get so upset. I knew you were going to die. Just I didn't know when. That's the truth. That's obvious. That shows you that, you know, you're understanding much more of life. And you become a much more effective human being. Little by little, deeper and deeper. It happens to people after a while. They find I don't belong in the office anymore. You try to do as much good work as you can, but how can I survive like this? You are inner conflicted, which is one of the reasons why we, you know, building places like NBM, we need more. It's not like like a COVID uh, quarantine hospital for people. And that's quarantine come, uh, COVID comes, COVID goes. But a place where human beings, even you, you get to a certain stage in meditation in your practice and you, know, you don't belong there in the office. And you've got to find places for you. So that's how it works. But don't be conflicted about things which you haven't reached yet. You find there's no conflict at all. When you get there, there's just so much happiness, so much joy. So much sense of freedom. Like, oh, why did not I do this before? Okay. <laughs> okay. Next question, whoever is there. Thank you, Roger. And uh, this one is uh, Abby. Would you like to unmute your mic? Hi, Abby. 
Hello, Ajahn. Nice to see you again. Excellent. So, um, question I wanted to ask you. Um, uh, since, uh, did it, since my time in Myanmar and did a retreat with you in Malaysia, um, I felt that, you know, this path is where I want to pursue. But for the time being, uh, I have some uh, responsibilities to take care of my mom. So although I've resigned from my work to, you know, focus full time on practicing meditation, etc. But right now I can't go and stay at NBM as per the plan. So these days I find uh, myself in a little bit of turmoil because I'm trying to be self-disciplined at home and try to, you know, be like a home-based monk, but it's not fully working. Uh, some days it works and other days I'm like, oh, I just should go back to work for the next year or so. so. I wanted to ask you, how could I kind of find the motivation to keep going myself at home practice and, you know, without going back to work or other normal life? Or next year or so? One thing, you don't need much to survive in one world. So <coughs> people waste so much money buying expensive things and eating expensive food and having a big car. Even when I was a student, we worked out it was cheaper to go in a taxi everywhere and actually own your own car. Simple things. So see how you can live more more frugally with less possessions, which means you don't need to, so much money to survive. And number two is make sure that you know, your meditation is important. You're looking after your mother and your body your mother's got used to you now and that when you meditate, you can't be moved. In other words, you just make meditations really important and you can be much kinder and more sensitive to your mother after you've had some beautiful meditations. And it's the joy of the meditation, the depth of it, the clear mindfulness. That will give you the motivation. And as the Buddha said, the mind leaps to these things. It feels good, it feels right, it feels wonderful. So you just do that huge amount. And you also, but no, don't waste time having Instagrams and Facebooks and all that sort of stuff, which that's not really necessary, is it? I not really. So you can save a lot of time. I don't have a Facebook. Actually, someone else has got Facebook for me with my name. I don't. I've never seen it once. <laughs> I don't know what they put on it. They keep a nice, simple forest mark, and it's nice and easy. So try that. Yeah. Okay. Um, Ajahn, uh, I have, I have this uh, desire to find like a spiritual partner. I'm like, oh, if I could find a spiritual girlfriend, that could be so nice. We can practice meditation together. <laughs> but to be honest, I know that's not really the case, but yeah, that's, that's what I guess, Trev. <laughs> that's what Ajahn Shah used to say. That's trying to find salt, which isn't salty. <laughs> or water which isn't wet <laughs> you get attached you can't have it both ways sorry <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay next question okay uh we'll go forward there's a few people there seems to be some cue jumping i'm not sure what's going on there but um, oh, i'm gonna go for leo now and leo if you unmute Hi, John. Hi, Leo. In 2019, um, I came for the retreat. That was very useful and um, good to see you again. Yeah. Um, I've got a question. Like, uh, um, I can like let go of things easily, as you can see. After my hair's gone. Oh, it's not. It's only almost gone. Um, oh, it's, it's pretty, pretty good. Pretty good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but whenever I let go, people like like my family, my friend. They ask me question like, why did you, you know, why why do you let go? Like, you know, why you don't have passion? Like, and they get angry at me. So how do I respond to those? You just don't get angry back. Sometimes the way I'm just looking for time to pick up. The old story I Jan Chai used to say. So you pick up a pen, it's this heavy, you throw it away, it's only heavy when you hold it. So he so said that's why they go things. So I don't have to carry so many burdens. 
And they go, oh, you're stupid. You say, okay, I'm happy being stupid. <laughs> and they said, you know, this is a beautiful thing you're doing. And after a while, if you do it from the right place, it inspires people. People feel, wow, you're a much kinder person to have in our family. The old story behind that was this monk I ordained, and oh, his, um, uh, he was from Norway, not actually from Mali, another Norwegian monk. And apparently that he went home to visit his family. His father was very sick. And his uh, mother told he wrote a letter to him. She said, if you come back to Norway, don't wear a robe, wear a suit. And he asked me, so what should I do? I've got to visit my mum. And she said, I wear a suit. I said, no way. Tell your mother from me, it's either a suit or naked. Take your choice, mum. <laughs> I was a suit. And then sometime later, his father died. And I got this wonderful letter, which I should have kept, but from his brother, his elder brother, who said, we never really understood why our brother became a Buddhist monk. We were very negative towards him. But in a time of crisis, like our father dying, seeing how he behaved and his wisdom and his kindness was so impressive. I'm writing to you, Ajahn Brahm, to say the whole family fully supports his life as a Buddhist monk. Thank you so much for ordaining him. Lovely letter. At first, you don't, they don't understand because you're going a different way. But after a while, they see the benefit of that and they will just be proud of you. Our son is a good Buddhist. You know that in your heart, you have to do that, so just go for it. Excellent. All right. Thank Good. you, Leo. Uh, the got next in the queue is, I um, hope I get the name right, it's Supi, Supianto. If you can um, unmute yourself. Hi. Hello, Ajahn. Hello, Salamat Malang. Selamat malam. <laughs> Very good. <I> just <laughs> <laughs> still, uh, still remember Indonesians. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Ajahn. Um, Ajahn, I, um, the message from uh, when, when the Buddha got enlightenment and um, the Brahma Sahampati uh, talked to him and in his message, in his message, Aja Brahma Sahampati said, uh, leader of the caravan, uh, please teach and open the door of, to the deathless, open the gate of the deathless, the gate or door of the deathless, isn't it that right? And what is the meaning? What is what do uh, according to Ajahn? What is the meaning? It's it's the, like you might say deathless, but that's a very poor translation. It's amateur. It's you might as well say that when you go beyond um, a virtue, you're preceptless. Beyond precepts. Beyond good is, is goodless, like deathless. So it doesn't mean like um, going to a state of existence which never dies. It means all this birth and death, coming and going, existing, disappears, it stops. It's just a word which sometimes people use out of context, like conditioned and unconditioned. If it's unconditioned, it stops. It doesn't move, it doesn't exist. So these are things which are concepts which many people employ, not knowing what they're talking about. The meditation is not deep enough. And they employ these words to confuse, and they confuse these people, so they're confused as well. Because this is not talking about Seeing, ceasing. There's this wonderful um, ana analogy from the Buddha. This was in the Agi Wachagota Sutta, in the Majjhima Nikkha, Middle Egg Sayings. It's when he was asking 
uh, Wachakota, what happens when a fire goes out? And said, well, what is a fire? A fire is just, you know, twigs and heat. It's a, it's a combination of the fuel and the heat. He said, when one of those gets exhausted, there's no more fuel left, or something blows the wind, the wind blows the heat away, then where does the flame go? The flame doesn't go anywhere. It ceases. It's finished. He said, that's just like the human consciousness, or any consciousness. When its causes are extinguished, the result is extinguished. This is in the Banas. We have this um, blessing we do in the Ratana Sutta. And the last verse, Kina Bija, we will he chant Nibanti Dira Yatayang Padipo. Nibanti Dira Yatayang Padipo means in the Banas, just like this lamp, this oil lamp, when the wick on the oil or the heat ceases, the flame ceases. So that depends on origination. So after a while, it's not like deathless, that state of existence beyond anything. This is just causes and effects. And the effects cease once the causes cease. The end of things. Ah, uh, Paris says, uh, Nibbana means with nothing remaining. Nothing. It's one of those uh, tendencies of human beings uh, that whenever we talk about Pari Nibbana, Pari means complete Nibbana, nothing remaining. We talk about this, people always want something to keep. It's like the last um, retirement home of your essential self. You work so hard to get enlightened, you don't want to totally vanish. There's that sort of attachment there, that desire, that wanting, which is still there to have something that is the difference between someone being enlightened and something being deluded about enlightenment. So little by little, we just let go of everything. Nobody there to hold on to anything. So that's with the amata, or the unconditioned, or the unenlightened, or the unethical. <laughs> Beyond ethics, unethical. And sometimes people do that. There was this one guru, I won't mention his name because he still has followers. He once said he was so detached he wasn't even attached to detachment. Funny words, but there was an excuse for indulgence. Okay. Thank you for that question, because many people ask it. Are you, you okay with that, uh, Supianto? What do you want to ask again? So the... Yeah, the, the main idea is that the teaching leads to Nibbana. Yeah, it does. Mm. Simply because that it does yeah. need not just a teaching. The two courses are you need the teaching and the practice. Yes. So you can go to university and you can probably learn more about Buddhism than I would ever know in theory. But it's not just the teachings, it's the practice of them and putting them into practice so they work and you disappear. Very good. Right. Namo Buddhaya. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ajahn. Namo Buddhaya. You're right, John. Uh, we've got now Venerable Campbell. <laughs> Hello. Where are you? <clears throat> I'm good, thank you. I'm trying to eat my lunch in between. <laughs> oh, Venwood <laughs> Shanda. <laughs> okay. Oh, you have lots of time with me. Okay, go on. 
Well, um, one of the things I, I think is important is to um, thank you, first of all, for talking about so many inspiring uh, monks, especially Ajahn Chah and other monks who became enlightened. But I just want to point out that there are so many of your disciples who are women, in fact, the vast majority of people here. And I wonder if you think, you know, having representation matters so that women can also feel that it's possible to be enlightened. And Absolutely. also perhaps a story of enlightened women or women that you know who um women from the buddha's day or women in the present day oh, yeah. who have enlightenment it would be very uh nice for the women who are listening thank you yes there's lots of really great women of course you know my favorite of all bhikkhunis patachara lost her her husband her two children and her two parents on the same day and she went crazy, went mad. And then she was wandering around and lost all of her clothes, but perfectly naked. And she wandered into the Jetawada Monastery where the Buddha was giving a talk. And I mention this because sometimes, and for good understandings and ideas, people are trying to protect the monks and the nuns and think it's not right for a naked person to come into the temple when you're giving a talk. And they tried to, to chase this, this woman out. And the Buddha said, no, let her in. Just get her some cloth and her to cover her nakedness if it offends you. But so once gave him a spare rope, her a spare rope, and the Buddha taught her. But just the idea of welcoming in, not rejecting anybody because they're badly dressed. If someone's badly dressed and is offending somebody, just give them something else to wear. But don't chase them out. Don't make them feel they're unwelcome. And then afterwards, that she became this incredible teacher. And apparently in the Terry Garter, the way she got enlightened, you know how she got enlightened? She was watching a, an oil lamp. And I think a wind blew the flame out or the wick that was exhausted. And that simile I said, what is enlightenment? It is the flame. The flame went out because its main causes were extinguished. And she was just great bhikkhuni, because uh, when I started reading the Terry Garter, uh, the poems of the senior elder nuns in the time of the Buddha, and maybe a little bit afterwards, but they're great stories. And this was the one where, <laughs> well, none after none after none, just a whole heap of them. They said, oh, they weren't getting anywhere in their meditation or in their spiritual life until this great teacher came along, Patachara. She was an amazing teacher. And, ooh, incredibly powerful. And so many people became fully enlightened after hearing her. So, that's the resource which we should have. The Reynolds channel all the way in England, just, you know, living just very little personal support, physical support, enough food and money to pay the bills. But people, but people actually just to go be with her, another bhikkhuni, to actually, so you can take a rest and go and retreat and stuff. What a beautiful thing that would be. And the same here in Australia. We've got a few bhikkhunis over here, but nowhere near enough. But anyway, I just heard from a lot of people Recently, the, the senior bikini over here, Venerable Hazar Panya, she gave a, last night's talk at Damaloka and said it's a brilliant talk, apparently. And it's nice to see the nuns actually growing. They're getting confidence in their teaching, and wow, this is my retirement plan is working. <laughs> well, do you think, Ajahn, that that representation is part of um, encouraging confidence in women? Yes, certainly. And they go, this is, this is really well. And so more and more of those women, they feel that this is a, a spiritual path for them. And it is so true. We've got so many gurus and, and popes and archbishops and stuff. And it's throughout the whole of spirituality. And even the Tibetan tradition, where are the nuns? So Mahayana just hats off to them. At least they have lots and lots of really great nuns. But you know, great Theravada nuns. So please support them and just build this up and so we can have flourishing bhikkhunis. 
real bhikkhunis, they're daughters of the Buddha. They're called Sakyadita. That's what it means, Sakyadita. We have a Sakyadita society in the world now. Sakyadita was supposed to be a society which is supporting bhikkhunis. That's what the Buddha said Sakyadita are. So, you know, Sakyadita should support the bhikkhunis and let them grow and develop. It's worldwide. I did hear somewhere that, I'm not sure if it's true, but Sakyadita in England, they don't support bhikkhunis. They think it's all controversial. Oh, come on, get real. Sakyadita means bhikkhuni. Sakyaputa means bhikkhu. I'm a Sakyaputa. Sakyadita is Venerable Chanda, she's a Sakyadita. Venerable Pekka, Sakyadita. Hasapanya, she's a Sakyadita. It's the word we use for them. So a Sakyadita society, they should be true to their name. And go out of the, out there and support the bhikkhunis. It's controversial if they don't. Okay. <laughs> I'll see you again soon. Venerable. <laughs> Okay, we've now got Tina. Tina, would you like to unmute your mic? And you might want to turn on your camera as well, please. Um, I'm unable to turn on my camera, but uh, is it okay if I raise my question? That's yes. Fine. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, Dyer, um, uh, Ajahn Brahm, I, I need to know uh, when I'm doing metta meditation halfway through, I hear scary noises closer to my ear, asking, threatening me to stop my meditation. Therefore, I stopped uh, medita sitting meditation and I shifted to walking meditation. Now, in meditation, the main thing is we need to focus on one thing. Now, when I'm walking, there are like so many things happening, like as in you lift one leg and the sh uh, balance is shift to the other leg. And when you walk to the end of the path, you need to turn. So there are so many things happening. What I need to know is uh, where should I focus on? Because unlike in sitting meditation, in walking meditation, there are so many things happening. Uh, where should I pay my attention to? Because sitting meditation, I'm really scared because I get goosebumps. I get, I really get uh, scared when those scary noises, uh, you know, whisper to my ear. So that's why I shifted to walking meditation. Please guide me. Okay. There's only one thing happening at a time. In walking meditation, stay in this present moment, there's only one part of your body moving at a time. What's moving right now? So keep that awareness in this moment and just be kind to it. So simple to do. If your mind is being smeared over time, you've got past and present happening, where you're going to move next, what you're going to do last, then of course there's too many things things the same with what you're doing in meditation sitting down is stay in this moment it's a simple place just now and soon that time vanishes people are prisoners of time they're worried about what's going to happen next what they should do next they're worrying about what happened in the past and all the problems of the past and they're not really paying any attention at all to what's happening now happening now is very simple it's happening. You can't do anything about it. It's here. So just be in this moment. Really full on. And that's not Eckhart Tolle. That's Bhante Karata Sutta. And three of them are living in the present moment. Magic Milikaya, taught by the Buddha. But anyway, so that's how we do these things. And look, if you get these voices in your, when you are meditating, sitting down, get some of the guided meditations on your your iPhone and just put your earbuds in and just listen to them. Listen to my voice or some other teacher's voice or a great voice when you are meditating, sitting down and to block out those stupid sounds where they're coming from. I don't know, but they're not truthful. No one can make you scared. You only allow them to make you scared. They only have the power that you if them. Okay, thank you very much, Ajahn Brahm. I tried the I will try the audio option also. Thank yeah, you very much. Great. Thanks a lot. Namo Mudaya. Namo Buddhaya. And Sister Eugenia. Hello, Ajahn Brahm. 
Hi. Hi. Nice Happy Visa nice Day. Happy Visa Day to you. Happy it's a long time since I attend Happy your. Happy Visa. Yeah, I, yeah. I, it's been a long time since I yeah. attend your uh, the teachings uh, face to face. I mean, in Singapore. Yeah. So um, yeah. thank you for sharing and your teachings today. It's wonderful. Um, no yeah, problem. It, 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 no it problem. Give me, <laughs> give me more energy that I want to really gain enlightenment better. Yeah, within this lifetime, hopefully. <laughs> Yeah, and also um, I have two, maybe two things I uh, like to, like you to help. Um, I know that right now, not just ourselves here. I mean, it's global. COVID nineteen is a madness, you know, kind of situation. Global pandemic. A lot of people having anxiety. Um, I would like you to help, give some advice, for Buddhists like us and or practitioners like us. Please let us give us some instruction. You know, some some orders, some command from you. Uh, <laughs> what know, we should do, yes, as yeah. a combined yeah. and uh, a, you know a, a collective effort, so that the re the whole world can uh, can also be you know influenced and impact by our positive uh, meditative energy. This is one thing I ask of you. First one, second, um, can you guide us in celebration of this visa day, a probably a very guided short uh, meditation so that we can dedicate any merits we could accumulate to all the world peace and personal inner peace uh, to all of us and to you as well can you help me with this i have only these two requests right now yeah there's, yeah, there's, there's a lot there's... of requests we've only got a few minutes left in this session but anyway just for the anxiety just you have a, a a choice between anxiety and hope hope is when you look in the future with a positive mind uh, anxiety is when you look in the future with a negative mind remember those two bad bricks in the wall story if you don't know that it's in my first book the first story the first book but those two bad bricks in the wall it's sometimes we look at the future we see all the things which might go wrong in the future ah but look at all the things which might go right in the future Singapore is, you know, has outbreaks every now and again, but it's not that bad in Singapore. It's not that, honestly, not, not, not that bad in Melbourne. It's locked down. So it's locked down. Great. More meditation. More time. You don't, many people complained beforehand they didn't have enough time. And going to Singapore a lot, you know, I just really felt sorry for you. You get up really early in the morning. You stay up late listening to monks like me. Oh, it's just really full on. And so sometimes it's nice that you have lockdown. Yay! You can actually do work from home. You don't have to travel. You can have much more peace, for, peace in your life and more time with your family and friends. Yay! So to see the positive side of things, and that overcomes anxiety. Look, years and years ago, I said in Singapore, don't worry, be hopey. Not be happy, be hopey. H-O-P-E-Y. And you find out that positive attitude which you have, looking at what might go right in the future, allows more things to go right. And for the whole world, peace with the whole world, I'm going to be controversial here. If the whole world was at peace, people would learn nothing. They take it for granted. So sometimes the difficulties we have in life is actually where we, where we learn. We learn a huge amount from crises. So and they're great opportunities to have kindness towards one another. People who haven't got as much vaccine as as Singapore has, so he sends them over to the people in other countries. Opportunities for loving kindness. Okay. So next question, because we've got enough time. Enough time. Question. Next question. Remember the guided meditation. Thank you. Later guided meditation. Guided meditation. For okay. all of us okay. here in, in, in this session with you, at least maybe 60 seconds. Okay, so, okay. Close, your so eyes. close your eyes. Be quiet. Be quiet. Okay. <laughs> that was a very short, 60 seconds. But I'm very aware of the other th questions coming in. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ajahn. Okay. Keep, we... When you meditate, keep it simple. Okay, Ajahn. Uh, Dennis, could you unmute your mic, please? 
Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Um, hello, Ajahn Brahm. Uh, long time no see. Um, <laughs> Hi. And thank you very much oh, yeah. uh, for being available on Zoom. <laughs> so yeah, good. even me in Indonesia can can communicate with you. <laughs> <laughs> See, the Buddhist Society of Victoria should change its name to the Buddhist Society of Indonesia. Interna <laughs> of international. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. So Ajahn Brown. Um, so the, I, I don't know what's happening to me, but these days um, I've been feeling very angry um my my speech is very harsh to people like i i i'm aware of that but uh i i, I can't fix it like i always regret it but again when a situation arises I, i get angry very easily and sometimes use a harsh word on people um it, it, usually like um i mean when i was younger like i was more, more patient like Like I see the world as a happy, jolly place. Like um, I see things as a positive mindset. But once I go into the workplace, to reality, through through marriage, then you know, like lots of things happen. Deception happens. Getting tricked. You know, like it's very yeah. hurtful. And I don't know, Ajahn Brahm. Like, how can I be more positive again? Or should, should I be more positive? Like. <laughs> Please guide me. If you try to be more positive, it makes you worse. So don't <laughs> try. You find the causes. It's a wonderful time now in COVID. If you're in lockdown, you have a bit more time to use that time wisely. I'm not going to say next. Do some meditation, especially some kind of meditation. I've got my, oh, this is, I won't put this too hard. Oh, this is much better to use. This is the little um, uh, mouse. This string over here, if it's very, very tight and something hits it, it will go bing like a guitar string. If it's nice and loose, what have I done here? I shouldn't really touch anything. Like Oops. <laughs> okay, I'll go back in. Hello. I'll get back in. I think. Yep, I can get back in. Oops. Am I... Can you hear me? Yep, you're still online. Okay, very good. Okay, I can't see myself, but I see myself too much. But anyway, that when you um, a, a string which is stretched tight, even a small thing hits it, bing! If you loosen the tension on the string, bing, you can hear it much easier. It's much, sorry, you don't hear it as much, it's a lower tone. If there's no tension on that string at all, even big things hit it, you can't hear anything. This is my simile for resilience. Resilience means that um, when you have uh, tension in you, you find that, I'm going back in now. So I'm just getting out, there we go. When you have uh, tension in your life, it's in your body, in your mind, small things make a loud noise in your life. Now, you know, you don't have that much resilience left because you're tired. So what that means is that you do have uh, these experiences of overreacting. Small things create loud noises in you. You're a tight string. And so if you can meditate some more, take some more time, more relaxation, more rest, and you find that you won't get so upset with other people anymore. Be more peaceful. I understood, Anjan Brown. Okay. Um, yeah. So does that mean if I'm stressed, I should avoid people? <laughs> I just yes. maybe. <laughs> yeah. Whenever you can, please do so. Got it. Okay. Thank you, Ajahn Brown. Very good. Okay. Thank you, Ajahn. Well, I think it's that was probably going to have to be the last question for the night. We've got two minutes to go. Um, okay, you can fit in another question. Come on. One more question? Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm going to go. I can't see the... anybody. That the vision of my thing is gone, but and nevertheless. Okay. okay. The next person on my queue is uh, Yu Ying. You... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just, oh, that's a good step. Well, Arjun Brown, thank you for the uh, for the talk and the the, um, the best guided meditation I've, I've ever heard. <laughs> oh, where's Yu Ying? Is that Yu Ying? Uh, yes, this is Yu Ying. Okay, yeah. 
Yes. So any, any other question? Yes, I do have a question. Oh, yeah, um, you just talked about avoidance before um, to avoid situations where, um, you know, it can create, you know, discomfort. Um, yeah. Uh, I actually am finding that I'm avoiding situations where I feel like um, I've made a mistake um, and, and a sense of shame. Um, and so, and then I avoid the uncomfortable situation. So I feel like, um, yeah. Uh, and I guess the question is um, that sense of shame, um, you know, judgment of myself and sometimes judgment on others. Um, yeah. Well, what is the, uh, what is happening there? <laughs> oh, it's just, look, number one, Somehow in your life, you've got this idea that you have to be perfect. You have to live up to other people's expectations and ideals. You don't need to do that. It's okay to make mistakes. And when you do make mistakes, I always say, let all your friends know what those mistakes are. They really make people laugh. And <laughs> one of those mistakes I made years ago, which I, it was so funny, I wish it was videoed, was that I was in Penang Airport, uh, just being taken to the airport, and then about to get on the flight to come back to um, Australia after giving a retreat there. And they gave me this really delicious milky tea or coffee drink. I think it was coffee or something. Delicious. I'd had it before, but then they had a straw in it and I started sucking out. It's good you can't see me here. Can you see me? Yes, we can still see you. Oh, okay. I can't see me. <laughs> but anyway, had a straw and I started sucking it out of the straw. But the straw was blocked. I couldn't actually suck the, the uh, delicious coffee, milky, sugary drink uh, into, my, into my mouth. And so I tried even harder. And my, my <laughs> cheeks were blowing up, going red. And all of my <laughs> followers, they, were looking, they, would, they didn't have the, the faith to actually, or the confidence to tell me what I was doing wrong. So they started putting their hands over their mouth and trying not to giggle and laugh. But after a while, they couldn't hold it anymore. And they started laughing. And I took out the straw. And it wasn't a straw. It was a spoon. It was a plastic spoon. One of the first time I seen one of these spoons in the coffee shop, which didn't look like a metal spoon, but was just a, looked like a straw. And I was trying to suck the coffee through, through a, a spoon. <laughs> And I'm supposed to be a very smart monk and very intelligent theoretical physicist. And I didn't even know the difference between a spoon and a, and a straw. But instead of feeling ashamed, it was a wonderful time for humor. Where we could laugh. I could laugh at myself. It's one thing I'd learned from a Northeast Thai culture in the monasteries. We would laugh at each other, laugh at ourselves. And there's nothing wrong with that. Because every time we made a mistake, it created so much humor. As a young monk, I made so many mistakes. I really was just caused so much laughter for my teacher, Ajahn Chah. Oh, he loved having Western monks around, stupid Westerners, and all the silly things we did, which made, them, made him laugh a lot. <laughs> but we learned from those mistakes. We weren't ashamed by them. Everyone makes mistakes. It's an obvious thing. So when you make mistakes, own up to it. No shame involved. You're a human being. You make mistakes. But shame should be hiding mistakes. That should be shameful. Admitting them should be, say, well, look, I'm making a mistake. I, I messed up. And, and tell everyone about it. And it's very funny. So that little by little, that's how you change from being ashamed to learning that mistakes are the fun of life. The bloopers which you make in life. So please let people know what those bloopers are. Thank you. Are you going to let us know your, your most embarrassing mistake today? Uh, most embarrassing mistake, a mistake was um, falling asleep while I was cooking and um, <laughs> burning, burning a little bit of the food. <laughs> Very good. I, was I was having a nap with my beautiful kids. So it oh, was, uh, that's it was nice, worth it. yeah. It probably tasted really nice. It was still beautiful. Because you did it from love. <laughs> Absolutely. It wasn't Absolutely. a mistake at all. <laughs> okay.
Okay, Ajahn. So uh, there are three other people there. I thought I'd just ask, and we but we are out of time. We're over time at, at the moment. Yeah. So in other words, if I carry on, it's allowable? I think so. Okay, go on. Okay. Uh, let's go for uh, Nahin. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. If you could unmute. Hi, Ajahn. Um, thank you for the talk tonight. May I ask you, um, if uh, someone doesn't go into jhana, can they still achieve enlightenment? Thank no. you. A very easy question. Answer is no. The, <laughs> the Eightfold Path is the eighth factor. It's jhanas. Sama Samadhi is always explained by the Buddha as jhanas. So if you don't achieve a jhana, you, you can't achieve enlightenment. It doesn't matter because you will achieve it anyway. It's not whether you can or you can't. It's whether you, you have yet. Soon, soon you will. No worries. But you do need it. Absolutely. Okay. Yes, thank you. Next question. And uh, the, uh, Dira Yipa, um, I hope oh. I pronounced that correctly. Ping pong. I'm sorry. Hi. Adika Ajahn. Very good. Yes, um, I'm not enlightened. You know that. <laughs> Who and, knows? <laughs> so the, the thing is, I'm trying to live a simple life, trying to lessen my defilement, my craving. But I still live in the society. I meet people. And sometimes my defilements come up. And, and I just, oh, I want a big house like them. You know, I would like to go to, you know, Europe like them. And oh. I, it's, it's difficult to, <laughs> to. Well, now you're meeting me. So you want to uh, not go to Europe like me have a small cave like I have. You know my cave, it's very, very small. So instead of, you know, if you're going to sort of uh, aspire to live like your friends, I've known you a long time, so aspire to live like me. I meet many people. I'm out in society often. So no problem. Yeah, but of course, but... don't, try and, don't try and live up to other people's expectations. <laughs> the, the thing is, I... You, you inspire and inspire me, but yes. the thing is, defilements come up. How do we deal with these defilements when they come up? When they come up, they come up. You allow them to come into your, your mind, into your heart. Remember that saying to open the door of your heart, to let whatever comes up comes in. But you must always remember that the door has two purposes. One to come in, one to go out. <laughs> so once the farmers have come in, you get to know them. Well, I don't want you in my house, so out. And the farmers go out. Okay. But it is a fascinating, a deep point, is that, you know, you have to allow these things to come in, first of all, before they can go out. So don't block them. Don't be ashamed of them. Be honest to them. He says, oh, this is, why am I keeping these things in my house? And then open the door, they go. Thank you so much. <laughs> Good to see you again. Uh, Jack, last question. A, last yeah, question. On. Well, I'm going to ask this one on behalf of Jose, who is in Brazil, and he, um, he oh, wasn't yeah. able to um, ask the question in um, verbally because he would wake up people in the house. So it's a brief <laughs> question. Do yeah. stream winners really only reincarnate at most seven more times? If so, no. do no. they experience jhanas in all seven of these lives? No, they only reincarnate another six times. This life is counted as number one. So six ones. Do they, do they get jhanas in those lives? Quite likely, yes. They've got a natural inclination. Look at... Um, the boy Siddhartha Gautama, who was to become the Buddha, 
He was a six or seven year old kid and he was sitting under a tree and attained a jhana. Where did that come from? He had no instructions, no uh, one telling him. He was a, a little kid. Do you know, how many kids do you know who can do things like that? And sometimes, you know, you see some of these kids come to our centers, these small little kids, and they just, there's obviously, the, you know, they've been a Buddhist before. I remember just had this big exhibition on Buddhist, Buddhism in Sydney um, Art Gallery or something years ago. And they had all these big uh, posters and drapings uh, in central Sydney about the Buddha. And I went over there to give a talk. And it's very inspiring to see just the whole of central Sydney was draped in Buddhist iconography. It's brilliant, beautiful. But anyway, just going there, just one day when I went in there, this kid, maybe about eight or nine years of age, was dragging his mum, I mean, literally, you know, with holding her hand and dragging them towards me because he saw a monk. And then he, he put his hands up in the Anjali position. His mum said, well, I'm not a Buddhist. <laughs> this kid is, and he's dragging me here, he insisted on coming to this exhibition. And I look at him. And it was just so, so inspiring for me to see this little kid so excited about being in the Buddhist exhibition. And they had, you know, when you have go to these, it was an art gallery, I think. And they have these, um, the brochures, the, it's like a book of all this beautiful artwork which was on display. And I couldn't resist. I got my. Yeah, I got a free copy, and so of course I gave it to the kid, signed it. This is for you, and come and say hello when you grow up. And it's so inspiring to see things like that. That you know that people obviously they do get attracted you know, to Buddhism and to meditation, and they find it reasonably easy. To Thank you. Happy Visa Day. Thank you.